Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So good morning to all of you here, Lindell family, as well as to everyone who is um, participating online. Uh, who all was here for the building um, renovation meeting? I just wanted to say personally, thank you so much to the team that has been doing all of this planning. I am really, really excited for our church. So it's good to see everyone here. Hopefully everyone has received their bulletin. Um, it's chock full of information as well as you looked over your Friday announcements. In addition, that has lots of really good information about prayer requests here in our church family, um, as well as abroad and lots and lots of um, announcements. One of the things I wanted to highlight is that this week, um, Anna Ressler, she will begin her supervised ministry experience here. Um, I believe she will be here on the, tw the 24th. <laughs> so um, I just hope that we can welcome her with open arms um, and show her what a loving family that we are. Um, if you ordered cookie dough, it is here. If you order the cookie dough to help support LCCP, it's here and Teresa will have it all ready for you after service. All right, so the spring season is definitely upon us. This is one of my favorite seasons of the year besides fall comes in a close second. Um, for me, the word that comes to mind each spring is freshness and it's freshness in the air, um, new and beautiful flowers blooming as the ones that we can see right up here up front. Um, spring is also when many folks do what kind of cleaning? Spring cleaning, right? <laughs> um, my kids don't really like that, but it is essential that we do that. Um, while summer is the season when most um, babies, human babies, are born, um, the spring is actually when most animals are born. And according to you know, the well-researched Google, in the spring, baby animals are born in the spring because the weather is mild, days get longer, and resources are plentiful for mother and baby to produce, um, to produce quality milk for babies to nurse. Mother, mother mammals need better, need better food, which is provided in the form of green, fresh green grass in the pasture in the spring and early summer. So similar to spring ushering new life, all around us in creation, we are hopefully freshening up um, our own lives. We are seeing God afresh. We are feeling the energy that um, is swirling all around us. The, um, the focus of today is gonna be called to transformation. And we as God's people, our children, are called to change completely, become something new, change for the better, um, shedding of our sinful selves. And spiritual transformation is definitely not static. It is active. When Pastor, Ro Pastor Robert called me on Friday to let me know about the, the change in the focus today um, to a call to transformation, I immediately thought of the verses that I'm about to read. I didn't know where they were in the Bible, but these um, verses came to mind. So the first one is in Romans 12:2. And it is, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And the next ones are found in Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Transformation is definitely active. Amen? Amen. So um, the best part is, though, we don't have to do this alone. God as our creator, our heavenly father, the potter, um, as we have been seeing these last few weeks with Barb and the clay, he gently holds us in his hands. He molds us, he shapes us, 
he reshapes us and reshapes us some more. And it is because he loves us beyond measure. He wants us to be made perfect. In Isaiah 64, 8, yet, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. And now I'm excited for this next part of our service. Um, we are going to celebrate new life through a baby dedication. Um, we have the privilege as a church family to come alongside each other and share in this really wonderful responsibility of teaching the good news, not only to our own children, um, as well as to all the children within the church family and through our words, our deeds, our actions, as well as to support the parents. So I wanna invite um, Jared and Alyssa, and if they want, to, they're bringing, I'm not sure if Emma's with them, but um, sweet baby boy Luke for his dedication. Um, also, if there's any family members who wanna come up with them are welcome to come up at this time. We welcome you all here, and thank you for coming up. And so, Jared and Alyssa, would you introduce these special people? Um, we have a lot of family and friends here today, but um, Jared's parents, Don and Beth Green from Salisbury, Pennsylvania, are here. And then my parents, Mark and Wendy Cable from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, are here. And we've got lots of cousins and aunts and uncles and friends um, over in the back corner. So will you stand up back there so we can see you? <sighs> Thank you. <clears throat> One of the privileges that I had was going to Jared and Alyssa's house to meet Luke and then also got to meet Emma. Um, got to enjoy a meal with them and see a little bit more of what life is like for them in their house with these two young ones. <laughs> and one of the things that really stands out are Emma, it was your dinosaurs. You showed me your dinosaurs, and you have so many of them. And I, this morning, thought I might help Luke out just a little bit. Um, and I would like to present him with one of his own. I don't know if you have a, your own dinosaur collection started, but here is one for you, and this is an, a nice dinosaur. It's a triceratops. Am I saying that right? Say that again. Triceratops. So now you have one of your own, and it has the, that parrot-looking beak to help break plants off and eat them. It just has to stay away from Emma's bigger ones, because you have bigger dinosaurs that like those. And that's what I read about anyway. <laughs> well, that was very fun to share that evening with you. And, and Luke, I know you were initially a little wary of me, and maybe still are a little bit, Huh? Would you mind if I held you just a little bit? Because this is a real privilege for us. I mean, look at all these people out here. We're t we're t see them? <laughs> is that intimidating to see all those people? These are the people that care so much about you and want to be a part of the shaping of your life for when you're here among us. So... And it's, it is really great to have the parents here, too, because it's not only about the church, but it's about the extended families. And Don and Beth Green are good friends of mine and Louie Enns. Um, we were pastoring together at Springs Mennonite Church um, in Springs, Pennsylvania, and that is where Don and Beth attend. So we have known them from there. And it's wonderful to see the rest of the, the, the grandparent family because of the way in which you all help in the nurturing and shaping of these lives. So I have two questions for you, Jared and uh, Alyssa. Do you rededicate your home as a place where Luke's spiritual nature may unfold and grow, to lead and guide so that Luke may be able to respond in faith to the love of God? Do you accept the trust that God places in you for the care and nurture of Luke, and do you desire 
with the help of God and His Spirit, to be faithful as Christian parents. So along with the parents' rededication, we want to dedicate you, Luke, to God. His love for you is beyond your understanding, our understanding, but we know that God is with you and wants to remain with you for the rest of your life. And I'd like to share a prayer with you. So let's pray together. Dear God, together we dedicate Luke and this precious family to you. We know that life may not be easy, but we want you to be the center of their home. Thank you for Luke's love for people and his joyful spirit. And we ask that he will always choose to follow you. Amen. So now, congregation, church family, is your turn, our turn to respond. And we will have the words on the screen for you to share, to read. They, there they are. Jesus, today as a community, we come with joy for this time of dedication. We desire to support Jared and Alyssa in watching over, nurturing, and caring for Luke. We thank you for the privilege of being a church family and community together. We pray you will fill Jared and Alyssa with strength, wisdom, and laughter in this awesome task of parenting. May you be their shepherd. We long to encourage this family to care for them and support them. We ask for your peace and joy to reign in their home, in their relationships, and in their hearts together. God is with you, Luke. God is with your family. Amen. Special blessing blanket for Luke. Luke, this is for you from all of these people. And maybe when mom wraps you or dad wraps you in that, you will feel wrapped in Jesus' love. And Emma is going to help us set, tell Luke that Jesus loves you. Can you tell Luke that? Jesus loves you, Luke. Jesus loves you, and we do too. And God is with you. And they have chosen the song from Zephaniah 317 that Kevin will lead. Um, and it says, the Lord, your God, is with you, and he delights over you. Thank you. Please turn to number 173, 173.
540. And let's stand as we sing, Will You Come and Follow Me? 540. Number 765, 765, listen, God is calling. Thank you. 
Now it's time in our service where we will be receiving the offering. Um, before we do that though, the steward and finance committee wanted me to share um, with you this update. Thank you for generously responding to the fellowship hall renovation fundraising goals. Your gifts and pledges are moving this project forward. We are now eight plus months into our spending plan year and our congregational year to date giving is under budget by 40,000. Because we do because we do not anticipate expense savings for this for the year, we will need $60,000 per month from May through August to meet our spending plan. Please prayerfully consider how you can support Lindale's budgeted materials. Now I would like to um, invite the ushers to come forward to receive our offerings here in the sanctuary. And for those of you who are watching virtually, um, you may give online or mail in your offering to the church office. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, there is so much to be grateful for. For new life, Luke Green being dedicated to you this morning, the Fellowship Hall renovation, LCCP, ministering to so many children now and through the years. May your offering be generous, may our offering be generous as we come together as a church family to support the many ministries here at Lindale. Thank you for blessing us with your love, guidance, and continually shaping us into the holy vessels filled by you to reach out and fill others with your love and your gift of salvation. Amen. children's moment.
Hi, how are you all today? It's a yeah, how about that? It's a little face, isn't it? Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about what happens to the clay after you've made it. Now, this is the one we made the first day I was here, remember, with coils? And this is drying right now, but you cannot, you cannot do anything with this yet. Because if I would put water in this, what would happen? It would melt. It would turn right back to clay, right back to mud again. So it's, it's drying, but it's not ready yet to put in the kiln. The kiln is the oven, the big the hot fire that we put this in, in order for it to become hard. And the one way you know that is you put it against your cheek, and if it's cold, you want to feel? If it's cold, let me, let me put it against, here, let's put it on your arm. Is it cold? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's cold, you can't put it in the kiln or it will explode. Yeah, so you put it against your arm. There you go. Is it cold? I've seen some pictures of it. Have you really? You want to try? Come up here. Let me use your hand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not ready. But I hope to have this ready in a couple of weeks. And so you can tell this one still is wet because it's kind of a darker gray. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen this clay. You've seen it when it was all mud and then when we wedged it. Yes, they are. These are ready. I'll move them over here. So you've seen it when it's been wedged. Okay, I'll show this to you in a minute, okay? So what would happen if I put this in the kiln right now? It would explode because it's still wet. It could have a bubble inside and then it could explode or it could be still have some water inside and that would explode because it would, it would try to get hard too fast. So you put usually pieces of pottery are fired two times. The first time it goes into the kiln and that makes it hard. It's called bisque firing and they get that word from um, a French word but then that means bisque but they also a British word that means biscuit, they call a hard cookie a biscuit, and they call this a bisque firing. And these, these, um, they are like little beads. These are bisque fired, and they're hard, like that. I don't even crack. But, no, but are they pretty yet? Yes. Oh, yeah. thank you. Are these better? These are more interesting. Yeah, you can see. You can touch one. Okay. Yeah, okay, now go sit down. You can look at a minute again in a minute. <laughs> look there. Feels good, doesn't it? Yeah, that's a bird. I like this. Yeah, pretty bad. Yes. They used to look just like this. They did, and then they went in the kiln. And what, they, what you do is you put what we call glaze on the pottery, and in this little jar right here is glaze. When this is fired, it's going to be a dark, well, what color do you think it's gonna be? Look at this. When I, when I put this on here, what color do you think this is gonna look like after, after it goes in the kiln? Take a guess. Red is a good, good guess. What color is it? What color is it now? It's kind of a gray, right? When it goes, and when it goes in the kiln, it's going to turn reddish orange. That's because there there are some colorants in this that will turn reddish orange and. There's sand in this, and it's going to look like glass. And that's what this is on here. It's just a coating of glass on top of the kiln, I mean, on top of the piece of pottery. You brush it on, or you dip it in a big vat of glaze, so you can do it all in one time. You hold it right here and dip it right down in. You can see where my finger got in the way there, my thumb, probably, and no glaze got on there. So and, uh, they can be fired in different kinds of kilns. They can be fired in an electric kiln, a gas kiln, 
a wood-fired kiln. Well, probably not just like that, but close, huh? Yeah, because it like had about that from the black spots and had a compass Yeah, but everyone is different. You know, when they're made by the potter, everyone is different. And I think clay is a little bit like our lives, right? <laughs> Every one of us is pounded and punched and made into different shapes, and then we're formed into unique people. And these people that we've been through, it's not always easy. There's trials and there are hard times that come our way. And I think that being put in the kiln is a bit like being put through life with God in control, that we get purified of all the things in our lives that are not so good. Things like, have you ever been angry? or jealous, or thought you were better than somebody else. That's called pride. But that kind of washes and burns those things out of our lives. And I think God helps to ha help that to happen to us. So we have to remember always that God is in control. And he's making us into the people, the beautiful pieces of pottery that he wants us to be. Um, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for each child that's here this morning. Um, guide their lives, help them to understand that you are guarding them and you are guiding them and help them to choose Jesus in your ways. When hard times come, they can turn to you, knowing that you are bringing them closer to the person you want them to be, the beautiful and finished piece of pottery. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Barbara, for all of those things you showed us about pottery and the lessons that you gave us about life. This is Barbara's last time, and she's been here five times. Let's thank her for all of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. And this will be your last time to get a little piece of caramel clay, kind of like the pottery. Okay, then if you are age three to grade three, there is children's church in the lower level for you. Okay, thank you. Well, as, as the kids make their way to their parents or downstairs to the lower level for children's church, um, we have two scripture readings for today. The first is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse, verses 25 to 31. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each by, of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those whose hope is in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And the next reading is from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And this scripture takes place on the Sabbath. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there, in, now there in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, a pool, 
which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Blessings to you, Robert, as you bring us the word. In this series that we've been doing, Is God Calling Me? We have been trying to get a bulletin cover that would relate to each of the themes that we went with that particular Sunday. And one of the things that was fun about this one was I couldn't figure out what to put on there and happened to ask um, Isa and Sophia if they would be willing to draw a picture just based on reading John 5, what Debbie just read. And so that is what you saw or see being projected up here. That's Issa's drawing. And Sophia's is on an insert in the bulletin that perhaps you can add more of your own doodles and coloring to that during the service. So thank you to both of them for being willing to do that. It was uh, great fun to see what emerged. I want to set the context in the beginning here. Of It's pretty quick pretty simple. The first thing that we learn to know is that there's a festival that is going on. There's some kind of feast happening. Doesn't tell us what the feast is, but we do, I think, can infer that there was probably a lot of people here in Jerusalem more than would have been normal. And it happens, this story, beside a pool. And surrounding this pool is five porticos. They offer protection from the intense sun as people lay around the pool. And these long covered porches are supported by columns at regular intervals. I mean, it would have been very pretty, almost resort-like in a sense. But what we see then is that it's the people that are surrounding the pool that really define what this space is all about. Verse 3 tells us that it was crowded with those who suffered from diseases and those that were lame, those that were blind, those that were paralyzed. And the only sense of this being a resort is this was kind of their last resort. Like all of the physicians have run out of options. There wasn't anything that anybody else could do. And so they would lie there, hoping for a miracle. One thing that's interesting in this passage is that you could tell a friend sometime, look up John chapter 5, verse 4. And most of the translations will not have that verse. It'll go one, two, and three, skip four, and go to five. Because verse four was added at a later time. It's not in the original text, but at one point it was added in there to let people know why they were looking at this as their last resort. Was because at a certain time, and it's like nobody knew when that was going to be, an angel would stir the water, and the first person who could get into the water would be healed. And so they would be waiting there, waiting to see if they could be the one. And then we're introduced to this man who's been waiting there for 38 years. At least that's how long he has been in his condition. And there's a good chance that he was at one time well, that he wasn't an invalid. But perhaps something happened that ended up making him that way. So this man that is on the mat finds himself in this conversation with Jesus. And it's hard to know why this one stood out to Jesus, if there's such a crowd around here. Why was it this man? We're not really told. Why was this the one? But Jesus asks him, I think, a most peculiar question. Do you want to get well? Because I mean, doesn't it seem obvious? It, 
That's what we're all here for. That's what we are all laying around this pool for. We wouldn't be here if that wasn't our goal. But do you want to get well? It might have been obvious to the people who came to the pool that this person had been there the longest. I mean, if the average age of a man at that time was in their mid-50s, that's the lifespan, I mean. If he was paralyzed for 38 years, he could have been known as that, the longest one, and had somehow never been able to be the one to get in. We have an idea of what that feels like sometimes. Always hoping, always longing, always trying for seeking some kind of healing, but never receiving what we're waiting for or hoping for. But Jesus sees this man and asks him the question, do you want to get well? He sees the need and the longing, and he sees the needs and the longings of us. And the man doesn't give a direct answer, but rather he goes on to explain, well, sir, there's nobody here that can help me get into the water, and when the water is stirred, someone else is always getting there ahead of me. So even though Jesus knows something about this man, it seems this man knows nothing about Jesus, that he's actually looking at the one who could actually heal him, the one that could help him in a way that no one else can. And he says, sir, I have no one to help me. And immediately Jesus tells him to get up, take up your bed and walk. And immediately, without any stirring of the water or plunging in, the man was made well. He picked up his bed and walked. It didn't seem like there was any muscle atrophy because he continued to walk around as the story continues. And it was on the Sabbath that this healing happened, and people were trying to figure out, the Pharisees were trying to figure out who, who would be so bold to heal this man on the Sabbath day. So why do we bother telling this story? I mean, why did John include it in the gospel? It's pretty simple, and it feels so fast-moving, and it is the lesson here that we, we know that in our sufferings, in our longings, in our hopes that Jesus sees us, and that Jesus is the one who is the ultimate healer. Is that, is that why it's included here? And yet I think there is something that is much deeper in it that is captured in this question And perhaps it's a question that you and I may struggle to answer if we would have it posed to us by the one who sees us. The one who's capable of actually healing us. Do you want to get well? Twenty years ago, I was an on-call chaplain at a trauma, level one trauma center, large hospital where we've got the worst of the worst cases that would come in often by helicopter. So I was the on-call chaplain one night, the only one in a 700-bed hospital. Could make for a very busy night. And one of those nights, there was an infant that came in late, late into the night, brought into the emergency department, and the team of doctors tried their best to save this baby, but they weren't able to. And in addition to that, the child's death was suspicious, which meant that there would need to be an investigation into the cause of its death, so it became what is called a coroner's case. No one would be able to be with the body of this young child until the investigation was done. I went into the quiet room where the family was staying, and I talked to the mother and informed her and her family that her little girl had died. And through her tears, she asked if there was any way that she could see her daughter. And that's where this story gets a little complicated. I went and talked with the lead investigator from the police department, and he allowed me to bring the mother in to see the baby but only the mother. No one else was allowed in the room except me. And I sat by this young mother as she cradled her child in her arms and began to weep and then began to wail uncontrollably. And I looked at the investigator 
was standing there with his arms at his side, kind of giving her her moment, but waiting for her to be finished. And I began to get angry at him. I was angry because he didn't allow anyone from her family to come and be with her, not her boyfriend and not her mother, who were just down the hall in the quiet room. And when we, we are in clinical pastoral education, we have to use instances like this to write verbatims, like we'll write the conversation out, like this was the presenting incident, this is what I said, this is what they said, this is how I responded, and we'll have to reflect on how that was affecting us, what was going on for us, and we would have to present this in a peer group. And so I took this case, this incident, and I presented it to my peer group and to my CPE supervisor. I read the verbatim to my peers, and my peers were the first to give a response to me, and they could ask me questions. And they focused on what seemed to be to them you know, fairly good work on my part in getting the mother to be able to see her baby and also wondered about, so what was it that was really triggering my anger at not letting, for the investigator, not allowing the, her boyfriend or the mother to come in? And I really don't remember what all they said. What I remember is how my supervisor looked. He had his arms crossed, seated there at the end of the table with his head back, acting like he was bored beyond measure, very impatient with this inept wisdom coming from all around the table, from my peer group. And he finally interrupted and he said, we can talk all day long about what this anger is and Robert, where it was coming from, but if we're really going to help him, we've got to get to the heart of what is going on here. And then he looked at me and he began his assessment. And he said, Robert, for one thing, it is almost impossible to get permission to gain access to the body of the deceased in a coroner's case. And he said, I have no idea how you were even able to do that. I have never, ever heard of an exception being made. So rather than you being angry at the investigator, you should feel a good bit of gratitude for what he allowed. Because that was pretty compassionate on his part. His second point, that in the moment when I was so angry at the distant invest investigator, just feeling that well up inside of me for not allowing anyone else in the room, and he said, Robert, what was wrong with your arm? What was keeping you from being Jesus to her in that moment and wrapping your arms around her, holding her while she mourned this bitterly painful loss. Well, I didn't grow up with a family that was very comfortable with touch and affection. And my supervisor then turned to this passage in John 8, and he read it. The same verses we read this morning. And just as Jesus asked the man if he wanted to be well, my supervisor turned to me and he said, Robert, do you want to get well? And he began to help me see that our relationships are never going to be free from sexual tension. That even though it is there, it doesn't mean we're going to cross a line with someone. It's just there. And what he helped me see is that my upbringing made me so wary of this tension that it made, me, made it, it more about me than about the young woman and what she was going through. And it kept me from seeing the other person and it kept me from being with her in the depth of her pain. That changed my life. It helped me understand that there are many things that can keep us from really being with one another and keeping us, can keep us from being fully present to each other and keeps us from being fully alive with one another. The man by the pool was waiting for the water to be stirred so that he just might possibly be healed. 
But that wasn't the only purpose that these porticos served by the pool. It was also a place where a person like this man could beg. So there was a benefit to being here, even if you weren't the one who would be healed, you could at least maybe eke out a living and find your way by the gifts and alms that people would give as they would come and go. I think we all have times when we wait for the waters to be stirred and it doesn't ever come. And it can make us resort to other ways of dealing with our longing to be whole, and we can fall into coping behaviors. We might abuse alcohol, use pornography, use drugs. We may go buy clothes. Maybe we drive fast cars. Become workaholics. All because these behaviors they do stir the water a little bit. They do make us feel a little bit more alive or at least make us look alive to others. They make our lives just a little more bearable. Bury the pain a little deeper, all the while keeping us from really being present to one another. So when I hear someone say that they're struggling with coping behaviors like any of these, I'm not as concerned about the behavior itself as I am with wanting to know what the longing is that's underlying that. Because if we only focus on the behavior, all we will do is add to any sense of shame they might already have because of the behavior, which ironically will drive a person and draw a person right back to that behavior again. It's a coping strategy. These behaviors can make us feel like we're becoming a little bit alive, but they're not life. They're not life in and of itself. Not the kind that Jesus is talking about in this passage. They make us feel alive in the moment. Jesus asked this question to the man sitting by the pool in the house of mercy, as it was known. That's what Bethesda or Bethsaida, that's what that name means. It's a place of mercy. He'd been there in this condition for 38 years, and do you want to get well? And I think that this question is offered to each of us. That's when this story doesn't become so simple. It can be a really hard question. Do you want to get well? How would you fill in that blank? What's the longing that that would be answering for you? Like, do you really want to find forgiveness? Grant forgiveness? Do you really want a changed relationship? Would you really like a new attitude? Would you like to end coping strategies and behaviors that you know they might cover things in the moment, but they really don't bring the sense of life that we want to have. All of these things can keep us from being fully alive and fully present to those around us. These encounters with Jesus really center on two questions. It, it's fairly simple, yet as we answer them, it's like being fired in a furnace. And that's what can make it feel so difficult. Because those two questions are, do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? And if you do, do you really want to follow him? So Jesus is calling me. Jesus is calling you. I think this call goes to all of us, inviting us to a place where we can get some of those things out of the way and dis discover what the, the inner call is to us, not just in following Jesus, but like, Robert, are you ready to move into ministry in a way when you can kind of throw off that wariness of being able to use your arms, use your voice, use your presence to actually be with people in situations that, as I grew up, I would have probably never felt comfortable in. 
And I don't know what it is for you, what God may be asking for you to consider. But wanting to be healed of something is not the same thing as embracing the new life that it brings because you can be a mean person with a limp and Jesus could heal your limp and you can still be a mean person without a limp. New life is going to mean some kind of transformative change. In some way, we're not the same coming out as we were going in, just like the beautiful glazed pots, the way they go in and the way they're fired. And they are, I don't know what that process is that the heat does, but they come out with such a lovely texture. They're so fun to, to, to hold and to see how that was created. Pottery is amazing when we see people and what they can create with it. But new life means that sometimes something has to die to have new growth. And sometimes we have to let the thing die, the very thing that we actually find some sense of life in. It stirs the water for us a little bit, helps us get through each day and each week, but to be transformed, we're going to have to let it go in some way. Real healing is about the whole person, not just the limp, not just blindness, not just whatever the, the longing is that we each have that we want to be healed from. It is, life is not just that going away. It's about a wholeness of really believing Jesus is who Jesus says he is, and do we believe Jesus is? That, that we are who Jesus says we are, that we are God's beloved. So it was out of this experience 20 years ago that I wrote a song with a fellow student of mine from our pastoral ministries program at Heston College. Her name is Karen Andrus. I had, we were, we were working on a song for our pastoral ministries commissioning service. And these words kind of come out of Isaiah 40, which is why I had that read. But it's really about sometimes the things that are set in front of us can just feel like huge mountains, like there's no way we're ever going to get through that or over that. But this song is a reminder that sometimes it's not about God moving the mountains that sometimes it's about God moving us, God moving me. And Kevin and Kara have been willing to give this a go, and I thank them so much for being willing to share this song. Sometimes you move a mountain 
much, Kevin and um, Kara, and thank you, Pastor Robert, for sharing that wonderful song. I almost couldn't make it out of my chair, <laughs> even though the song is God, you move, or sometimes you move me. Um, my heart was just very full. Um, now it's time for the benediction, and I got this benediction from I kind of pulled it back from MenoCon 19 um, back in July 3rd, July 3rd of that year. Um, and I hope I'm pronouncing this person's name correctly, but it meant a lot to me when I was reading this, trying to, um, as I was looking for what would be appropriate for today's benediction. So it's, it was written by Sibo Nokule Nokube. Now, go now, go in God's peace. Go and change the world with him and through him. Go and leave no one behind from A to Z, America to Zimbabwe. Come, Lord Jesus, peace be over you. Amen. Sing together 846, the Lord bless you and keep you. Let's stand as we sing. 